dogs welcome bike to the channel welcome bike to the hq and happy halloween well, i'm filming this on thursday but you're seeing it on saturday which means halloween passed but that doesn't mean you can't celebrate halloween tonight we got a party at the headquarters be looking out for the vlog of that i apologize that you can't see my ugly mug right now uh my obs is not opening it keeps crashing every time i launch it i don't know if any of y'all are streamers or you record content on your side of things but if y'all have had issues with OBS, the streaming software, please let me know how you fix that shit. I tried uninstalling it and reinstalling it. Nothing is working. I probably did something on the back end that fucked it up. Regardless, the show goes on. The content must be created and consumed by the big dogs out there. As always, we're kicking off the Saturday DFS portion of the video with Monkey Knife Fight. MonkeyKnifeFight.com. If you are new to the channel, they are a partner of ours. They are the best player prop game website out there. It's monkeyknifefight.com. If you sign up with promo code BDGE, y'all will get a 100% deposit match bonus. Once you sign up and use that, you'll see the home screen looking like this. If you play basketball or if you're into the NBA, if you're into other sports, they got all of them here. Obviously, we stick to football on this channel. We stick to what we know. We're like dead spin. We stick, stick to sports. We stick to football. I'm not trying to get fired. Eventually, I'm trying to hire a CEO that he could... So you could fire me. That would be the ultimate goal. That's really what I'm building here at the headquarters. But enough of my fucking nonsense. Uh, we're on our third coffee of the day. So if I am all over the fucking place, that is why. It's, 30, it's only 10.30 a.m. Let's talk about some player props that we love. Now, you could choose any game. And these are more fantasy sports related. These are not necessarily just straight up one-on-one -on -one player props. But if you head over to monkeyknifefight.com, you'll see one game that I absolutely love. I actually kind of like the Texans-Jaguars game as well because there should be a lot of points scored in that one. But we're going to go with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the Seattle Seahawks. Now, this was a game that we attacked last week, the Titans versus the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and we did an over on the reception count. It was Godwin, Mike Evans, and I believe A.J. Brown over 16 and a half receptions. So we nailed that bad boy. Now, this is an interesting matchup because we know the Tampa Bay pass defense is very poor. We know the run defense is very, 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 very good. On the flip side, the Seattle run defense is uh, and neither. None of the parts of their defense are great, right? If we head over to PFF.com, and this is their premium package, so you actually have to pay for this if you want a discount to PFF's premium package or their regular package, which you could see a lot of good stuff. Uh, I believe there is a promo code somewhere down in my description. Um, if we're looking at defenses, rush defense for Seattle, they are ninth overall per their grades. Uh, when we talk about pass rush, though, they dip down all the way to 30th in the NFL. Coverage, they are down at 16th. So their run defense is the strength of that defense. So it seems like it's going to be a lot of passing going on in this game. I think Jameis Winston easily hits the over on the passing yards just because um, I'm sure he'll throw three interceptions and have to dig himself out of that hole. So he's hit over on here. I'm actually going to go with under on the passing yards for Russell Wilson. I don't really have much of an explanation why. I just, it, it just, I feel it in my plums. I feel it in my guts. I feel it, it's tingling right now, the under. I feel like he'll probably throw for 282 passing yards, probably like four touchdowns, but just kill you with the efficiency. Um, and since Jameis will probably turn the ball over so damn much, they'll have good field position and won't necessarily need to have these long sustained drives down the field. So that's probably about the most logic you're going to get out of my face today. So I kind of like this. Um, the under on Russell Wilson, the over on Jameis Winston, but I wouldn't knock you for going over. Fade my picks, take my picks. It doesn't matter. We're here to have fun. We're here to play. We're here to win money, pay the mortgage, diversify the revenue. MonkeyKnifeFight.com is one of the ways to diversify the revenue. So right after this, right after you watch the second portion of the video, the DFS with Joe Holka, head over to MonkeyKnifeFight.com. Use the promo code BDGE when you sign up and they will 100% deposit match your first buy-in. So 10 bucks gets you 20 bucks. 20 bucks gets you 40 bucks. $1 million gets you thrown into the psychiatric ward because you're a fucking psycho if you're about to throw a million dollars on here. But y'all get the point. Let me close my window. People are doing fucking like jackhammering the sidewalk for literally no reason. Like, why are you jackhammering the sidewalk? It's like, I don't know, because it's Brooklyn and because you're filming a video, we want to piss you off. Probably the best explanation we're going to get. So we're going to go back to the well on the reception collection. But if again, if you're new, they have a ton of different types of games that you could play. You could do Strictly Fantasy Challenge, and it tells you up here how many you need to nail uh, to be correct and hit the money line. So for the over-under on the passing yards, you need it to be two for two. But there are ones where you can go over-under 
and you only need to hit three out of four. So you got a little bit of leeway. So these are for fantasy points. Do you think Russell Wilson will go over 22 and a half? Yes, sir, I do. Jameis Winston over 19 and a half. I'm actually going to go under on that because I think the turnovers, I don't know if he really, I just don't like playing in Seattle. That's such a tough game for, for Jameis. He's literally going as far away across the country as you could possibly go all the way from you know, the bottom right of our country to the top left of our country. I just don't think Jameis Winston is mentally prepared for shit like this. Fantasy points for Godwin and Mike Evans. Uh, If I hit the two quarterbacks, we'll just go over on both of them because you have a little leeway. You can be wrong on one of them. And this is full PPR as well, just so y'all know. But we'll probably go back to the well in reception collection. I think that if we go again with the Tampa Bay receivers and Tyler Lockett, we're probably looking at a handful of receptions because these guys are always good. One of them is always good for, you know, somewhere between eight and 10 receptions in a given game. And the other one will probably go for five. And all that means is you need like four or five from Lockett, which I think is locked up. We could lock it up with Lockett, baby. So what you need to do is you pick three players and you want them to have a combined reception total over 18 and a half or over 20 and a half or over 22 and a half, depending on how risque you want to get in this one, depending on, you know, what the reception total is, you'll win more money. So if you go with 18 and a half, you're going to 2x your money. If you go with 20 and a half, which means you have to hit 21 receptions collectively, which I don't think is that bad of a bet, um, and you throw 10 bucks down, you are going to win 30 bucks. Those are my picks today for Monkey Knife Fight. I'm attacking the Tampa Bay-Seattle game. I think the Houston game is another one to attack because Houston is without, I believe, their top three starting cornerbacks. Uh, They're without J.J. Watt, so there's going to be no pass rush on it. Gardner Minshew should go crazy in that one. And, you know, Deshaun Watson always gets it done. With that one, I would probably stick to something uh, fantasy points-wise, not necessarily yardage-wise, because we saw Watson struggle in, I think it was week two against Jacksonville. But I think he'll get it done because... Um, He doesn't always end up throwing for touchdowns in the games that he struggles, but he always ends up rushing for touchdowns. So I could totally see him hitting over 20 or 23 um, fantasy points. And then I would hammer the overs on all of the other guys on Jacksonville in terms of Minshew and DJ Chark and even Chris Conley over there. So I like that game as well. But those are the top plays for me this week on Monkey Knife Fight. Head over to Monkey Knife Fight after this or right now, to be honest with you, if you're trying to make money quickly. Deposit any amount of money. Use promo code BDGE and you will get a 100% deposit match bonus. Let's head over to the DFS DraftKings portion of the video. Love y'all. All All right, y'all. Thank you for for sticking around. And we're going to dive into the DFS portion of today's video with Joe Holka. As always, y'all can follow him on all of his social medias, which will be linked down in the description below. What's going on, Joe? We're filming this uh, early morning, which is actually preferable for me. I feel like I got a lot more energy and a lot more creativity when we're when we're uh, grinding away in the AM. How you feeling? Good, man. I, I always feel better in the mornings too, because sometimes it gets to be a little long if you're kind of waking up super early, and then we're we're recording what we've been recording kind of around like 3 p.m. or something like that. That's like the very end of my day as far as like uh, when I'm actually uh, at full form, I guess. So this, this would be good, man. I think this week is an interesting one. So we'll have to jump in here and, uh, and give the guys some goods. I, I appreciate everyone that's, that's still sticking around on the DFS show. Uh, I know a lot of you guys are kind of still in prime season long mode, but this has been a lot of fun. Yeah, I agree. Thank you to the audience out there that does uh, mess around with the DFS portion of this stuff. And as always, let us know in the comment section, you know, what you guys want to see more of and, um, if there's anything particular, cause at this point, um, a lot of the season long guys kind of start to drop off. Some of them are, you know, one and eight. So there goes some of the people and, and whatnot. Um, but, you know, as the audience gets a little bit lower, we could obviously get more specific with what you guys want to see. Um, but we're ready to we're ready to dive in. We're feeling good. Uh, let's let's jump into the quarterbacks, first of all. And you know, I was doing a little bit of research on the guys. My first glance around, and I'm like, there are some good, you know, mid-range, mid-range kind of value guys in terms of price on the board this week. I don't know if I want to go back to the high end, right? We talked about Deshaun Watson, who played well last week. We also talked about Russell Wilson, who did not return value on his uh, on his deposit. But I'm looking at a guy like Josh Allen, 6,500 versus Washington. And on paper, you're like, this is, you know, a great matchup. Um, Quinton Dunbar, who is – been kind of like a breakout player for the Washington Redskins, easily their best cornerback this year. It's actually literally PFF's number one graded cornerback um, in football this year. He left last week with a hamstring injury. So that would be an upgrade for a guy like Josh Allen. But Josh Allen, you know, he comes into the year as a guy that we think of as like a, 
a guy who can have some really bad games just because of his throwing accuracy, but a guy who has a really high ceiling because of his rushing ability. This year, I don't think enough people have really taken into account that he's not been a high ceiling guy. He's actually been a very high floor guy. Um, you know, he hasn't had a game with 50 rushing yards yet this year, but he ended last year with 95 or more rushing yards in like four of the last six games, which is kind of crazy. And he's only been over 20 fantasy points once this entire season. Um, but in season long, he's still like a good play. He's like a top 12 or 13 quarterback because he gives you a nice floor play. But at what point, you know, because you look at it first glance, and I'm sure a lot of DFS players are going to have Allen in their lineup. But uh, at what point do we start looking at Josh Allen as just a floor play and not a guy that we really necessarily want in our DFS lineups because the ceiling is not what we think it is? Man, I'm with you. Like, I've, I've been kind of thinking of Josh Allen as kind of more of a ceiling play, at least from the beginning of the season, too, just because of how he was throwing deep, he was running. So Josh Allen uh, last year was, I mean, he was kind of in the top quarter or so of yards per attempt this year, only 6.7 yards per attempt. That's basically like the, the main efficiency metric I'm looking at and trying to figure out guys that are willing to push the ball downfield. He just hasn't done that this year. So like, just to give you kind of some uh, guys that are in that same range, like Kyle Allen, uh, even just like someone like Mason Rudolph, like he's 6.9 yards per attempt. And then we have guys like Matthew Stafford at 8.4. We got guys like Russell Wilson at 8.5. Those are the kind of guys that we want to kind of attribute more ceiling to. So I'm, I'm with you. I think that it's a good spot for Josh Allen, in particular, someone like Cole Beasley, who I played last week, kind of with that win. But this matchup in particular, Washington 28th against the short pass, I do think that Beasley is squarely in play based on kind of how Josh Allen's been playing. But I'm with you like this. At some point, maybe we, we start to see that ceiling again. I really hope we do. But uh, let's not forget he had that injury early in the year as well. So I'm not sure if that's been uh, kind of limiting his his upside on the ground after he had that concussion. Um, could be. I mean, all the projections you're going to look at are still going to project him for close to 40 yards on the ground. But um, it's an interesting one because you don't really get a price discount on him anymore. Yeah, exactly. That's the thing. At 6500 it's like you want to have someone – I mean, that's that's $200 less than, you know, uh, Matt Stafford or yep. you know, a couple hundred dollars less than Aaron Rodgers who has that – 400 yard, four or five touchdown upside, whereas we're not seeing any of that stuff from Josh Allen. But you you mentioned a couple other guys like Matt Stafford going against Oakland. They've been red hot. They've been passing the ball a lot more. Uh, you know, I was looking at PFF's deep ball attempt numbers and Matt Stafford right now, he's on pace for 112 deep balls this year, which would be the most ever in a single season. And we're seeing it uh, probably become a case because Karen Johnson's out. They're going to have to rely on the passing a little bit more. And they have such good downfield weapons in uh, Marvin Jones, the Kenny Galladay, and Marvin Hall. Uh, my, my question to you, I guess, is at someone that's priced around like $7,000, which is where you can get like a really nice running back play or something, do you like a guy like Stafford in a good matchup versus Oakland, uh, but he doesn't really give you any like rushing part of his game? So does that kind of scare you away from a guy like Stafford? There's a couple things with this Detroit situation, and it was similar last week. So we, I like to kind of talk about that Goff uh, a couple weeks ago. Goff was in a great play, kind of similar, um, doesn't have a lot on the ground, but it, it kind of an elite matchup. Um, right. This week, Oakland is a team that, again, can be beat deep. So the complete kind of uh, polar opposite of the spot uh, for Josh Allen. So uh, 31st against deep passes this year. Matt Stafford, yeah, he's not going to give you anything on the ground. If there was a situation like this and I did want to attack in like some larger field stuff, I'd like to get kind of an ownership discount on, on Matthew Stafford. But that's the thing. People are on to this Detroit passing game and this offense in general. So uh, even last week, I, I was shocked. Uh, Kenny Galladay was like 30 percent in the millionaire maker. Like after we've had these games where Marvin Jones is going completely nuts, like there was a time in DFS where people would just kind of chase box scores, but now it seems to almost have gone the other way where people like really are, are targeting regression, or at least there's a lot of uh, good content out there for that. So like Matthew Stafford and that stack last week, I thought would be a lot more contrarian than it actually was. It could be another week this week where we see a lot of ownership towards those guys. And then you're getting to the point of where, yeah, his salary is at a spot where he really needs to hit that ceiling and he's not going to do it on the ground. So he's got to throw for, for three touchdowns to even approach uh, hitting value. Yeah, that's that's just, that's the the part about playing quarterbacks who don't have that rushing upside. It's like they need to hit their peak throwing capacity in order to return the value, which kind of shies me away from a guy like him. But if you can take the discount, right, like almost a thousand dollars less, I'm looking at I'm looking at a guy like Sam Darnold. I know he's been playing like absolute shit, but he's going against Miami, which is like the 
fucking antidote for fantasy <laughs> quarterbacks, right? And it's a team that can be beat deep. They have Xavier Howard, their arguably their best cornerback, their best player on defense, uh, headed to the IR. So this seems like it's not even going to be sneaky because, like you said, a lot of fantasy players are way more on top of the game than, you know, in previous years over the last five years or whatever. So a lot of people are probably going to be calling for a positive regression from Sam Darnold. But I love the matchup for Darnold. I like uh, Le'Veon Bell to have a big game. I like Robbie Anderson to kind of explode because they've been inches away from, you know, a few deep, deep bombs this year. We've seen him connect on a 90-plus yard touchdown. But I like Darnold going against the uh, against the Dolphins this week. I also like on the flip side of – Let's go. The, the staff magic. Uh, no, I was actually going to say on the flip side of the Detroit game, Derek oh, okay. Carr. I okay. like Derek okay. Carr a little bit with Tyrell Williams finally back. Detroit's defense has been uh, extremely, extremely disappointing. Uh, we thought that was going to be a strong spot. And that's, that's what's funny about the beginning of the year is like you watch one, two, even three weeks, and you think you have an idea about a team. But mm-hmm. defensively, we have no idea who a team is until probably about this point into the season. And Detroit's defense is, is is just not it it's just not it and it's not there and I think like Derek Carr someone who is 5,500 I think is someone that could put up you know almost Matt Stafford type numbers this week through the air if Stafford puts up his three touchdowns 300 yards I think Derek Carr can do a you know a 280 and three or something like that but you like Fitzmagic let me let me hear about that well you're hitting on all the guys man uh, this is uh this is one of the sharper intro like you said it like early in the morning we just got to start recording early in the morning no I like all those guys man I like Derek Carr quite a bit at 5500 like you said on the other side of this Detroit game um we're always wanting to target I mean if we really like Stafford in this game environment like correlating to the other side um, it's one of the strongest things you can do in DFS. So if you get a discounted price, it makes some sense there. Um, I wasn't so much on Sam Darnold, but I do want to take another look at him because, I mean, I, I love uh, this game. I love the Jets. I love Miami just because a lot of these guys are underpriced relative to their their target share. I talked about this being one of my kind of uh, sneaky uh, games in my, my stacks video this week, and I really like the idea of going after some of these guys. But, but Sam Darnold, like, I kind of want to break this down a little bit. One thing that um, – we've always like kind of been staying away from the Jets just because offensive line is horrendous, probably bottom three offensive line this year. But the good news is Miami pressure is almost the least of any team in the entire league as well. So we might get a little bit more time for Darnold this week, which is part of the reason I really like the weapons. Um, I mean, there's not really much to say about the, this matchup. It's, it's pretty fantastic across the board. Darnold, someone else that hasn't really thrown a ton deep this year, but I mean, he just has been kind of under siege in a lot of weeks. So I think we could see a bounce back spot for him. 5,900. I don't like his price as much as I like Fitzpatrick on the other side of this game, though. So 4,800 for Fitzpatrick. Um, You're getting to go all the way down. I think that a lot of these guys from Miami are squarely in play. We'll talk about Preston Williams, Devontae Parker. Um, I think uh, that side of the game is really intriguing as well. So like the stack that I talked about on my video was a Fitzpatrick to both of his wide receivers and then bringing it back with Le'Veon Bell or Robbie Anderson, like you said. So we're, we're, a lot of, we're on a lot of the same plays, man. One, one thing that I do like, too, uh, for Fitzpatrick, he's someone that is willing to take chances. And, like, I still think at 4,800, there's really not anyone else way down there um, that I can say that uh, I think will take as many chances as he will downfield. Yeah, that makes sense. I, th- I think that could end up being – I mean, I don't know if it's going to end up being a shootout, but at least in, in theory, it's a possibility. It, it's in the range of outcomes. It's not teams that really – are looking to establish the run in, in one sense or another. But um, I like I like all those plays. So we gave you a wide range of, of quarterbacks to mess around with. Now, if we move over to the running back position, we see C-Mac breaking that 10K mark. And I the question I ask myself is, like, at what point is, you know, that amount of money too much? And I think, I think what this week really boils down to is what happens with James Conner. Because we know mm-hmm. Benny Snell is out. Uh, James Conner dealing with his AC sprain in his shoulder. If he's out, Jalen Samuels will be in 100% of lineups pretty much this week at 4K because he becomes the three-down workhorse. He's the guy with the size, the speed. We've seen him already do it on the NFL field going for, you know, uh, 150 yards from scrimmaging games. So he he brings you that ridiculous upside. So he has to be in your lineup pretty much, um, no questions asked, which, you know, leaves you with two other running back spots, right? Is it C-Mac 10K? It seems like to me, Dalvin Cook has to be the, at least one of the running backs there at 9,500, but he's going against his Kansas City Chiefs defense, who is horrid against the run. And then in my eyes, I'm, I don't know if I'm going with C-Mac this, uh, in this week, just because I, Tennessee is a little bit of a tougher opponent. But, you know, like we, like we mentioned, I like Le'Veon Bell against Miami. Um, I also 
I kind of like Aaron Jones, too. He's been so good, and they're playing against the Chargers, who are a team that you could absolutely, you know, kill on the ground. I do have a little bit concern, uh, a little bit of concern for Aaron Jones because he's he's someone that can give you that, like, 40-point week, you know, week in and week out. But any any given week could also be, like, the Jamal Williams week. Plus, we get Devontae Adams back. Do the targets start shifting more towards the outside wide receivers again? Um, does he get less involved in the – Run game, I think even Derrick Henry is not someone that gives you much in the passing game, but at 5,700, he's kind of interesting if you want to, you know, pay up for wide receiver or tight end and get him because Carolina has been very – they're a funnel defense towards the run, not necessarily towards the pass, and that's probably not going to be a successful game for Ryan Tannehill and their outside wide receivers. So uh, with these, like, wide range of running backs that we can kind of choose from right now, who are the other two? I'm assuming you're going to have to play Samuels if Connor is out. Who would be the other two guys that you're looking at um, running back-wise? Yeah, I'm with you. Uh, if Connor's out, he's, I mean, Samuels is a lock at 4K, I think, even right. though, like, I mean, Indy's, yeah, they're a team that can be beat on the ground, bottom four, uh, and run DVOA. They, I will say that they're um, pretty elite at defending running backs in the passing game, so something to think about. They're kind of right there with someone like Tampa Bay in that respect. So um, from a ceiling perspective, uh, at least through the air, um, that's something to consider, but I mean, he's 4k. Um, he's, I mean, I got him projected. I, I took Connor out of my projections. I've got him close to 24 touches right now. Um, so that's, I mean, that's just a lock and load uh, for, for Jalen Samuels at that point. Um, so I think he'd be in for sure. Um, a couple other guys. Yeah. You mentioned Christian McCaffrey at 10k. Um, so a lot of people are not going to click that just because there's like this weird mental note of a guy being 10k. It happened last year as well towards the end of the season. But I've been saying it the whole year, like these guys, like realistically, these like elite Christian McCaffrey, Saquon Barkley, Dalvin Cook, these guys should be like 11K anyway, um, based on kind of their volume. So um, I have no issues with Christian McCaffrey. um, But like you said, there's actually a lot of good running back plays this week. Uh, And last week was actually a pretty similar um, spot as well. So, I mean, by far still have Christian McCaffrey projected for the most touches on the slate. Um, Tennessee is good against the run, like you said. So not a great matchup, but at least they're at home. Um, I, I think there's going to be a ton of plays in this game uh, for the Carolina side of the ball. So I'm into that. Um, I think that the two guys that I'm looking at, I'm with you on Le'Veon Bell. Um, there's always a little bit of risk there, but the matchup's so strong. And if he is going to be active, uh, like we think he should be at least, I, I get nervous with, with gay sled offenses. So who knows what's going to happen there. Uh, but Nick Chubb's another guy we probably haven't talked about, but I have him projected for about 26 touches right now uh, against this Denver team. On the road, they are a slight favorite, um, but I think at 7,300, he's got to be in the conversation. Um, not a great matchup by any means, but if you're trying to pivot off some of these other guys, I think Chubb uh, makes some sense for sure. Uh, Aaron Jones is a tough one for me, and I agree with you. The spot is great. Um, like the Chargers, one of the worst teams in the league at defending running backs in the passing game. Um, it is a nicer team total there. 7K, he's like to the point where I have a hard time justifying his like probably 17 to 20 touches. Um, he's got to be efficient and he's shown efficient, like kind of usage in the past. It's just really hard with all these other guys, I think have better workload, uh, potential. Um, but that said, like Aaron Jones, you're not really going to get a huge ownership discount because of his blow up game. It is the chargers, the charger and this game in general worries me because of pace and the chargers like really want to slow things down, um, if they can. So, um, Aaron Jones, I think is like larger field GPP only for me, but I think that he carries as much upside as any of these other guys, uh, Dalvin cook. Um, so if I, I like, guess to answer your question, um, the two guys outside of Samuels, of course, like I'm doing everything I can to play McCaffrey and cook, um, depending on what value we have. It, it's weird this week because the people that have been kind of following along, they've priced up a lot of these guys for this smaller slate. Like when we get to wide receiver, you're going to be shocked at some of the prices. Um, so it's going to be really tough to play McCaffrey and Dalvin cook. So if you, don't want to go to McCaffrey this week. I guess I have no issues with it. I mean, this Dalvin Cook spot against KC is pretty elite as well. Um, I think the Madison thing is real, like especially if they get out ahead in this game. Um, like they've been willing to just give him 10 touches a game. Um, and that takes away from Dalvin Cook's ceiling at 9,500, in my opinion. I don't think Christian McCaffrey has anything to worry about in that regard. So it's a tougher week where I think that at the top um, – there's a lot of volume up there, a lot of really good plays, um, but it's really kind of hard to, hard to narrow down those those final two for your single entry for sure if we do get the conquer out. Yeah, it's, it's pretty funny that they got Jamal Williams priced at 5,900 and you have Derrick Henry at 5,700. One other guy oh, yeah. I just want to touch on real quick, mm-hmm. uh, Ty Johnson of the Lions. Now, he was a big ad two weeks ago in season long. A lot of people dropped him last week. A couple things to note here. 
Uh, Trey Carson, who started and got more carries than Ty Johnson, although played less snaps than Ty Johnson, he popped up on the injury report yesterday with a hamstring injury. They signed Zach, uh, not Zach Sander, they signed um, Paul Perkins from the practice squad. So they're concerned about his status. If Trey Carson misses time, it's going to be the Ty Johnson show for a, a high percentage of the snaps, in my opinion. What people won't see in the box score, obviously Ty Johnson had a terrible game fantasy-wise, but he got he had like two or three um, double-digit yard carries called back on holding penalties. Stafford also missed him on what would have been a wide-open, like 40-yard touchdown reception, which is why you grab a guy like Ty Johnson for those big explosive plays. So uh, a few things break right, and we're looking at Ty Johnson as an absolute smash spot here against Oakland, who can absolutely be beat on the ground. But again, this is a a game where we expect a lot of points to be scored, a lot of passing to happen. And Ty Johnson is a a very good receiving back. And we've seen Stafford target him a lot, um, you know, while he's been on the field. So I think Ty Johnson in like uh, GPPs or tournament plays, or if you want to kind of fade consensus coming off of last week, not a lot of people are going to have Ty Johnson there, but I actually really, uh, I really like Ty Johnson in this, this spot. And I might even play him in a couple of my season longs if I am in a pinch here. Yeah, I think he makes some sense uh, for a couple of reasons uh, outside of the ones that you mentioned. Like if we do end up getting a popular Detroit passing game, just like trying to leverage the other side of that game script always makes a lot of sense to me. And what you said, like kind of the recency bias about what he just gave us, like I wasn't going to play him last week um, just with all the running backs they had kind of um, active, but he was still like 15% owned in the millionaire maker. So all none of those people are going to play him again. So I think you'll get him at super low ownership and kind of leverage the other side of how this game could go. So I'd be in for it for a larger field GPP for sure. Yeah, I mean, sticking with that game and shifting over the receivers, you said, you know, a lot of these guys are priced up. And we have Kenny Galladay finally, you know, probably around where he should be priced at, at 7,700. He's the second most expensive receiver on the slate. We have Adam Thielen, who's $100 more than him at 7,800. Still dealing with the hamstring injury. Uh, I mean, I obviously like Thielen if he comes back this week. My problem is we. J- I just saw comments come out, and Thielen says something like, Um, He didn't commit to that he was playing this week. He basically said, you know, in this league, it's all about being close to 100%. And he said, luckily, I have three more days to get to that spot. So right now, he basically just told you he's actually not close to 100%. He's got a couple days to get there. That makes me a little nervous because if I have a guy coming back from a hamstring strain, I want you to be, you know, very, very, very close to 100%. If you're at 75 to 80%, you might be slowing down some routes. You might, you have a a high risk for re-injury. So those two top receivers, I mean, I, I definitely like uh, Kenny Galladay at, at Oakland, of course. It, it's very hard to dislike him. But at 7,700, I almost might want to pay down for his teammate, Marvin Jones, who's, you know, 6K. And there's a lot of guys floating around in that um, area, like John Brown at 6,100 I like a lot. Uh, Terrell Williams on the flip side in that same game at 5,900. Uh, what are your thoughts on the receivers this week? There's not a lot of guys I love – paying up for because of either injuries or backup quarterbacks or you know tough matchups or shit like that yeah I'm I'm not sure I'm going to be able to make it work with Galladay and his salary this week like uh, he's projected to be around 16 percent owned which at that point I think he makes a really good fade relative to his price like it is a good spot there's really not a lot of bad things to say about it like you said Uh, Marvin Jones at 6k that's more expensive than he's been in a while as well but you're going to get an ownership discount I do think he's the guy that this matchup makes a lot of sense for in particular Um, he's one of those kind of buy low type of guys that's been seeing deep targets so I think that Marvin Jones is interesting in the mid-range if you're paying up it's probably going to be someone like uh, that you're really just trying to grab upside in GPP someone like Tyler Lockett at 7500 this great matchup against Tampa Bay. Um, And then if you wanted to go to the other side of that game, either Chris Godwin versus Mike Evans. Originally, I I was kind of on the Mike Evans side of that. Um, But I'm warming to the the Chris Godwin, um, if you were going to just play one of them. Uh, I guess that's one question I have for you too. Like in DFS, the problem with these guys is like, both of them haven't really been going off in the same game. So Chris Godwin versus Mike Evans, it just seems like if you pick the wrong one, uh, you're kind of drawing dead on a good situation. But uh, it's been tough to choose one. It's been very tough in season long, too, because it seems like Mike Evans is on the buy low or sell high, uh, you know, article for everyone, like every single week, because yeah. I mean, right now, I think they're both top five, if not top four in season long in terms of like fantasy rankings. So they're both having monster, monster games. I I think um, I, I kind of like Mike Evans a little bit because we're seeing it, it more now than I think we saw in the beginning of the year with Jameis starting to trust Evans a little bit more, especially with the deep shots and his hands are just so strong. So I feel like 
you know, maybe in, maybe in cash, you're going to go with Godwin because he has that floor as a guy that has, you know, he's a great combo of floor and ceiling, of course, because we've seen both types of games, but as a slot receiver, you know, you can kind of always bank on those targets, but I think we're seeing a lot more consistency uh, out of Evans. And if you get like the beginning, beginning of the season, kind of out of your mind and look at the last four to five weeks of play for Mike Evans, he's been fucking dynamite, you know, dude, it's, it's crazy. I know, I know like we had a earlier in the week or early in the season, sorry, we went over uh, kind of my data sheet that I make available for all my Twitch subscribers. And I'm looking at both these guys, they're back to back. They're almost the same price. Almost everything looks like identical across the board. The only argument I have in favor of Godwin, his yards per route run slightly higher than Mike Evans, but really not a big deal. They're both really strong. Uh, total yards over the last four games. Uh, I mean, Godwin slightly edges out Evans. So both of these guys, because they've kind of fluctuated between big games and not big games, like it, I can't even differentiate them very well in my in my spreadsheet. So that's why I was kind of struggling with it. No, it's like, I don't know. If you ask me who I wanted rest of season and season long, I, I'd probably take Evans, but I probably will end up regretting that not going with Godwin. I really don't know. It, it, it's such a tough um, – it's such a tough play this, I mean, this week and every week in particular, but like, like you said, I mean, Mike Evans has been, if you extended that to the last five weeks, you know, that would include his eight for 190 and three touchdowns. He just has that random, random fucking dud game in the middle, zero catches, zero yards against Marshawn Lattimore. Mm-hmm. And looking back at the beginning of the season, I mean, you're almost able to pick out which matchups we can expect him to kind of go off in or, or struggle in because it's, San Francisco was week one. So looking, you know, looking back and knowing what we know now, that's obviously an extremely tough matchup for Jameis Winston. Um, Then at Carolina, where he's getting shadowed by a guy like James Bradbury. So, uh, I mean, week nine, again, he's going to have a a little bit of a tough matchup, I guess. But, like, I I don't know. I guess I would take Mike Evans here just because I I like – I think I like Mike Evans more as a pure pure player, I guess. but I think you're I think you're just throwing darts and you're kind of just flipping a coin there. Yeah, so let's talk about a couple other guys. I, I do think that, like we mentioned in Miami, uh, that game is is really enticing based on some of the prices. So I think Preston Williams at 4,200, some point, someone that I'm definitely interested in. I think he seems like the, the primary target for Fitzpatrick. So I think his price is at a spot where I'd be willing to take a shot there. I mentioned Cole Beasley in this matchup against Washington in particular, a team that can be beat in the short area of the field. Uh, Josh Allen hasn't been throwing downfield as much. So I think that Cole Beasley at 4,100 is interesting if you're looking for kind of a, a lower own play. Um, on the Jets side of the ball, I like Robbie Anderson um, for his upside. I, I guess the Crowder versus Demarius Thomas thing uh, makes me nervous. Like if you look at their target share, it looks solid, but they're kind of splitting work between the two of them. They kind of like cancel each other out from a ceiling perspective. So probably won't go there. Um, a couple of guys that I really like this week from a regression standpoint, um, or I guess a positive progression standpoint, Curtis Samuel seems too cheap to me at 4,300 versus Tennessee. Um, I think that just like it, his target share of air yards or his weighted opportunity rating, he's like top 10 over the last four weeks. And, and we kind of haven't had them on the main slate. So from a DFS perspective, he's a guy that might be going slightly overlooked. Um, I want to get your t- take on Mike Williams because he's been kind of a polarizing guy in DFS. Like, He's like that regression guy that like the big game's coming and then he just drops another one in the end zone. He's still getting way deeper targets than someone like Keenan Allen, uh, Keenan Allen getting healthier um, against Green Bay. I don't know. This one, Mike Williams at 4,600. This guy stares me in the face every single week and he just fails me. So what do you think about him? Yeah, I mean, we're seven weeks into it and all that upside about how he's going to score double digit touchdowns and really break out. The guy hasn't scored a fucking touchdown yet. So the way I look at it with, I mean, you're, you're chasing that, you're chasing the regression. And sometimes that, you know, as much as you want to get backed by analytics, you just kind of have to look at it in the face. My friend asked me last night, he was like, uh, Mike Williams is available on the waiver. Do I drop Terry McLaurin for Mike Williams? And I'm like, why? How he, was like, he was like the upside. And I was like, bro, like, wh- have you seen Terry McLaurin play this year? Like he has so much upside when Keenum's in the game. And if you look at Mike Williams, numbers, he's had a couple big target games, but for the most part, he's between five and seven targets. He's somewhere between 40 and 70 yards. And again, he hasn't scored a touchdown. Now, obviously, he's not going to finish the year with zero touchdowns. But like for for a team that, I mean, the Chargers are not a good offense, not a great offense, but they score enough touchdowns where a guy like Mike Williams should be getting into the end zone. Right. I think it's, it, it speaks to, obviously, there are some unlucky parts where he drops end zone passes and shit. But it also speaks to, you know, them game planning away from that being like – their primary go-to in the red zone they have hunter henry back 
Um, and they just use these running backs so often when they get inside the 10-yard line in both the passing game and the rushing game. So it's like, yes, the positive regression is there, but it's only there because you can literally only go up from zero. So with Mike Williams, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to cut my losses. Um, I, I mean, I didn't really like him anywhere in preseason, but if, if you're still thinking about it, I would shy away from him. He's, he's been a guy that people, I mean, myself included, have been firing at just because everything should be lining up. I will say, and, and I know you've had uh, Matt Harmon on your show before, him coming out of college, he hated Mike Williams as far as reception perception. So I always have that in the back of my mind with wide receivers because it is a position where talent like really matters. So yeah. um, if he's getting the opportunity, great. There just comes a point where uh, he's got to start taking advantage of those opportunities for sure. Um, yeah. One more guy before we move on, uh, DK Metcalf. Like I, I think that he's still a guy – um, that's due for some some progression as well. Like Lockett is almost 2K more expensive than him on DraftKings. So if you're trying to get an access to just the Seattle passing game against this uh, pass funnel Tampa Bay, I think Metcalf's the guy that I prefer. Um, he's got such a locked in role in the red zone. I, I think that in particular, I like Russell Wilson, who's so efficient down there. Um, that role is not going to change. So we'll, we'll see games where he um, has at least the opportunity to catch multiple touchdowns. Um, if he does end up catching a deep ball along the way, uh, you're basically there at that price. Yeah, I mean, Metcalf was a guy – I mean, we've talked about Metcalf. We talked about him last week in a good spot, and I've talked about him in my season-long videos for a couple of weeks now as a good buy-low candidate. Mm -hmm. With Will Disley out, I mean, he was already getting end zone targets and red zone targets and deep balls and stuff. But with Disley out, he's like the only guy that he targets – when he's inside the 20 or inside the 10 yard line. So those touchdowns, maybe he's due for aggression, but they're not fluky because those are going to continue to come. And obviously they have a smash, um, a smash spot here. I do. I, I am a little bit concerned in just like him as an overall player. I don't think like he doesn't put up enough production as like an all around wide receiver for me to get too excited about. Um, I think you are trying to get a little more, a little bit more lucky if you're throwing Metcalf into your lineup. He's not someone that I necessarily feel good. I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm going to get my 10 or 12 points if he doesn't end up in the end zone, you know, because he could easily go out there. If, if he drops a deep ball, it's like, okay, damn, he went like three for 37 this week or something. Is, is he still playing just one side of the field? I don't watch a ton of film, but I just, everyone keeps talking about that. Uh, I, I, I don't know either, actually, because that was obviously yeah. a big point in the preseason. Right. People were like, uh, you know, worried about Metcalf and, and that kind of stuff. I do think a lot of the things that people were worried about have come to fruition but the fact that Wilson's playing at like an all-time level right now yeah. you know, shadows uh what we were a little bit concerned about now moving over to the tight end position I, I think something interesting that we should touch on that involves both the wide receiver and the tight end position uh T.Y. Hilton missed the last two days of practice we'll have to keep updated on what happens Friday but if he misses Friday he's unlikely to play Eric Ebron's also missed the last two days of practice too so those are two pass catchers that are going to be out um, possibly out this week and they're going against Pittsburgh who are you know a relatively good pass defense but they they can definitely let up a lot of points and in the game that we saw T.Y. Hilton miss earlier in the year Jack Doyle saw eight targets so I think just to have on the streaming radar for both season long and in DFS I think Jack Doyle down at 3,000 uh, makes sense I I'm curious to hear your take on these guys that are being streamed in season long leagues sure. uh, the Jonah Smith who obviously broke down yeah. uh, broke out who was in a great spot last week in a much tougher uh matchup this week against Luke Keekley and the Carolina Panthers. And you have a guy like Cameron Brait, who I, you know, I think people are starting to realize that he's not even really that good, even when OJ Howard is out. Um, but of those lower owned guys or those lower price guys, um, do you like a guy like Goddard? Do you like Jonu Smith again? Um, Jack Doyle, knowing that maybe Ebron and uh, what's his face? Uh, Hilton are possibly out. Like what's your, what's your plan of attack at tight end this week? Yeah, you left out one of the guys that I, I might like one of the best uh, for DFS. No Fant, I think, is right there too. I, I know that the, we have the we have the quarterback change there, so that's concerning. But it's not nine targets last week with Emmanuel Sanders not there. That just opens up target share for a guy that we know is a freak athlete. These rookies take a little bit longer, as we know. So I think he's interesting at three K. Uh, I love the the Doyle call. It's something I haven't really considered yet, so we'll have to keep an eye on that throughout the week as well. Just a huge target share is going to open up. It's got to go somewhere. Um, so that's interesting. I, I, I was kind of on the other side on, on uh, Cameron Brait. I was with you, but on the other side of a lot of uh, higher stakes players that I respect. A lot of people loved Cameron Brait last week at that price. I was never going to go there with Johnny Smith uh, right there. Uh, so that was interesting to me. Just the team that's shown us the entire season, they're just like not really that interested in throwing to their tight end. 
um, people remember Cameron Brate and his touchdown upside and all of that from years past. But yeah. I think people like you need to get that over, out of your head. Like think of him as a completely different player. Um, yeah, he still might have a role. Like it, like in the, I just don't think he has a ceiling whatsoever um, in this offense. Offense. So not so much on Cameron Brate. Dallas Goddard. Um, now that Deshaun Jackson's back, I think that hurts Goddard quite a bit. Uh, I think that now they don't really have to run as many two tight end sets as they were before. So um, if Dallas Goddard's going to be the chalk, I, I have no problem fading that. He's like projected for like 12% ownership this week, which I'm not interested in. Um, I'll just play Fant at 1% um, at that point. Uh, I think that there's a couple of guys down there. Like, I think that like, it's actually pretty deep um, this week for these cheaper tight ends. Uh, a couple other guys I think are at least interesting. Um, I feel like I have to keep bringing up Mike Gusecki until he does something, which may never happen. <laughs> uh, but if we like, I mean, I think Miami has a chance to gain a little bit of steam throughout the week from an ownership perspective, and no one's going to play Mike Gusecki. So um, I think that he's at least okay. Um, what do you think about Zach Ertz now that uh, hopefully we get Deshaun Jackson back? He's only 4,700. If you would have told me he was going to be 4,700 um, at this spot earlier in the season, I think that I'd be kind of all over it. Uh, his weighted opportunity rating, his routes run, like the only thing that's really not hitting is his yards per route run. So the upside's not really there in comparison to someone like Waller, Kelsey, Hunter, Henry, these guys are running deeper routes. Uh, but I think at 4,700, the volume makes a ton of sense for Zach Ertz this week, especially I think Deshaun Jackson coming back actually helps them maybe opens up the middle of the field a little bit. So what do you think about Ertz? Yeah, I'm super, super intrigued at this situation because, like, when when uh, Jackson went out in the beginning of the year, I was like, oh, this is going to open up so many targets for Zach Ertz. Man, I was actually diving into Zach Ertz a little bit um, over the last few days to look at some numbers. And he was a guy who was targeted heavily down by the, by the end zone last year. He has one end zone target on the year. Dallas mm -hmm. Goddard has four. So if Jackson comes back and they use less two tight end sets, that's obviously fantastic news for Ertz because I think Wentz uh, kind of finds his targets that he likes there in the end zone and just keys in on them. And that will be, if Goddard's not on the field for that, that will be Ertz and that will slide his way. So I like that. I just like, I don't know, just watching it, it just seems like something's off. Like Wentz is never looking Ertz's way and Goddard's just been such a, a big plan in terms of their, um, their offense. But I do like I do like the call that you know Deshaun Jackson coming back. Um, maybe that means less two tight end sets because we'll have Jackson, we'll have Alshon Jeffrey, um, we'll have Ertz, and then uh, I mean I assume they want to keep Nelson Aguilar on the field. Maybe use multiple running backs. At, yeah, multiple running backs at the same time. Um, so I kind of like that that Ertz call as uh, maybe a contrarian play at this at this point because he's done so poorly. Uh, up up to you know week nine but they do play against Chicago which is actually a, a very underwhelming matchup for opposing tight ends it says here on DraftKings uh, 25th in terms of uh, fantasy points allowed to the tight end position so I kind of like Ertz there 4700 I mean he's the fourth most expensive tight end but right. there's a huge tier gap between where Hunter Henry is at 6k and then Ertz down to 4700 so um, yeah I, I kind of like Ertz that actually got me excited as someone who it's, owned, uh, owned the stock in him. That's good. It's it's interesting. I don't know. It's a, it's a weird week at tight end because, like you said, there's such a big like tier gap. Like it completely changes your lineup if you're going to pay up this week. And I don't think a lot of people are going to do that with the where the pricing is for the other positions. Um, I think Johnny Smith might be my least favorite of these guys. Um, the spot against Carolina with the recency bias, like he's going to be much higher owned than someone like Noah Fant. So at that point, I would just prefer. Uh, to just play Noah Fant, I think a uh, very uh, cheaper price, but uh, lower ownership. Yeah, I really like that Noah Fant call too because he had such a big game with uh, Emmanuel Sanders finally out of there. And Emmanuel Sanders, like, there's a reason why he got those targets because Emmanuel Sanders is a legit playmaker. Like we saw that on Thursday Night Football last night. He he changes that entire 49ers passing offense, and that Denver offense is going to need to change accordingly as well. The quarterback change does make me a little bit nervous though um, without Joe Flacco there, even though like. What is, what is Joe Flacco at this point in his career? He, he's still mm. better than what a Brandon Allen probably offers you there. But I, I really like that Noah fan call from a, a DFS standpoint as well as like a streaming option for season long too because he keeps getting he keeps getting anywhere of like six plus targets. That automatically puts him in like the borderline tight end one range because that's how fucking ugly it is. Yeah, man, did you see this Emmanuel Sanders thing coming? Like, I, I mean, it's pretty miraculous what this guy's done off this injury, right? Dude, unbelievable. He's, the, you know... Coming into the year, there were guys I just stayed away from because of yeah. the serious injuries, older age. Same thing like Cooper Cup, eight months off of the ACL. And I'm just like, more often than not, it doesn't work out. And they're so much mm -hmm. better in their year two 
coming back from the ACL than, than the year one. The same thing with Emmanuel Sanders. It's just like, I fade them, but like, fuck, yeah. Like, I, sh- I, I wish I didn't fade them at this point because they look so, 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 so good. Yeah, for sure. All right, well, let's move over to defense and touch on these couple. Uh, I think there's, I mean, we're, we're just talking about Philadelphia and the offensive side of the ball. Um, I'm just going to attack Mitch Trubisky until he starts playing a little better, I think. Like, that offensive oh. line's horrendous. Philly, uh, 43.4% pressure rate this year highest on the slate so um, even though Philly's defense is thought about as one we can attack through the air I think that's true Um, but from a perspective of getting pressure against a quarterback that doesn't handle pressure well uh, at all so I'm interested in him I think my favorite pay up defense is Carolina against Tennessee I think we talked about this last week when there was all this Ryan Tannehill love that the spot made sense for Tannehill last week because they were playing against a team that doesn't pressure at all um the opposite is happening this week. Tannehill is, uh, at least over the last year, uh, the worst uh, quarterback on the slate um, at kind of adapting to pressure. His yards per attempt is almost five yards lower uh, while under pressure than while under a clean pocket, which he's not going to have a ton of uh, clean pockets this year, this week. So uh, I think attacking Ryan Tannehill makes a lot of sense. He takes sacks quite a bit as well. Um, I want to get your take on Green Bay versus the Chargers. I, I hate this game um, for plays and pace and all of that. Uh, but the Chargers, I have them as like a bottom three offensive line right now. They're passing a lot, so the, the volume should be there from a passing perspective. Um, pressure, uh, I mean, again, I, I mentioned Philly, Green Bay, second on the slate, 37.4% of their pressure, uh, I mean, of their plays have been um, pressuring the quarterback. So I, I don't know. I, I think Green Bay is interesting. Uh, I think that you can even pay all the way down uh, for someone like Washington, who's, <laughs> I, we're, we're talking about Josh Allen not really pushing the ball down the field, but. Uh, sub 2k defense uh, Washington I think is interesting too and a team that pressures a bit as well yeah I think, uh, well I'll touch on all those all those teams I think on the flip side of that game though if Dwayne Haskins is the quarterback it's going to be very 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 hard to fade Buffalo, sure. Buffalo this week <laughs> because Haskins is like oh my god he's he's unlike I've ever, uh, anything I've ever seen in the quarterback position he's going to turn the ball over minimum two times probably closer to three or four times so I'm not a big draft guy but that debut that he had like I don't know like how is that guy a thing (laughs) oh my god I know that's like I I hate to be the person who jumps at someone after like one game sure sure like oh my god yeah that was a tough one so he Buffalo is usually the defense number one in like kind of season long settings I also, when when it jumps back to you, I want to hear your thoughts on Jets versus Miami because, you know, up to this point, you're just like, oh, stream anyone against Miami. But the Jets' defenses look terrible. Um, they're going to be without C.J. Mosley, probably their top cover cornerback and Tremaine Johnson. So they're down a lot, of, a lot of pieces and a lot of personnel. And then Ryan Fitzpatrick is a guy, you know, that could chuck the ball down the field and luckily end up throwing up like 21 points or something. That just kills anything that the Jets could possibly put up. Um, in terms of the Packers, I don't know. They're not a team that's really excited me. I've tried to kind of guess when to play them in season long, and they're pretty good at home, but they've been uh, they've been kind of shitty over the last few weeks, and I thought they were in good spots uh, at home against Detroit, at home against Oakland, um, last week against Kansas City, and you had Matt Moore playing. Uh, yeah, I like, I like the matchup just because the O-line in, in L.A. has been, uh, like you said, terrible. But I don't know if Green Bay is a team that I would necessarily try to get into my lineup. Um, one team, oh, oh, one thing you did mention was Carolina against Tennessee. I, I do think that Tennessee is really going to try to hammer Derrick Henry with like 25 carries. So I don't know how well it's going to work out for the flip side of things. Good I'm not exactly point. sure about the health of, uh, Brian Burns. I think he played last week in a limited role, but he's been such a, like a revelation as a pass rusher for them as, as their first round rookie pick. Um, so if he's I'm not sure exactly his status this week but I think that downgrades their pass rush a little bit so I would keep an eye on that if you are trying to stream um, the Carolina Panthers this week and who else there was someone there's one, one more there's one more big one from a DFS perspective that I think people are going to be on uh, Cleveland against Brandon Allen um, oh, so I, I, I think he's going to be really chalky or I think Cleveland's going to be very chalky 
Denver's definitely yeah, below I mean, average. They have a conference. very good pass rush. They have a very good pass rush, and I could see them forcing a yep. bunch of turnovers. I don't know much about Brandon Allen, though. That's my thing. Me either. I guess that's that's one thing that I'm going to have to kind of continue to dig into throughout the week. That's good to know about Carolina because I was like all over Carolina. So I'll have to keep an eye on that injury for sure because Carolina is looking to be like one of the probably one of the highest owned options so uh, i'm not playing the jets at 3500 i think at that point uh they're priced up based on the matchup and i just don't play right. teams that don't pressure and the jets are uh, i think bottom on the entire slate and pressure rate so yeah i'm not not so much interested in them so we're definitely aligned on that one all right that makes sense well yeah i was i was kind of debating between the jets um i forget who i even oh i, I think i picked up dallas they're not playing on the main slate but i'm, I'm gonna end up streaming dallas who's playing at new york as nice. on favorites over uh, the Jets and I was kind of questioning myself at first but the more I think about it the more it's like you said it's like you're literally only doing it for the matchup but when you look at it the Jets aren't even like a real life good defense at this point they don't pressure they just got rid of Williams as well on the defensive line so it's like not a lot going there besides the fact that they're literally just playing against Miami so I'm gonna let, let other people mess around with that stuff in DFS yeah you're getting too cute with that stuff I, I agree there um, I think that's all we got for today's episode um so if you enjoyed, as always, make sure you hit that thumbs up button. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. If you are new, make sure you're checking out Joe's channel as well. Again, his YouTube, his Twitter, his LinkedIn, all the social medias that he is smashing these days, which is uh, good to see, Joe. I see you diversifying the revenue. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful I, I, I see you over on LinkedIn, my friend. I know you're, I know you're getting in those streets. I love that. I will, man. I, this offseason, I'm going to put a lot more. You know what it is with LinkedIn? It, it's a funny platform because – when I started posting, it was all those behind the scene interviews mm -hmm. that, you know, that, you, that I had you on for. And I was like, I want to put these on because these are very, you know, they're very much business related. And I felt right. good putting out the content that's relevant to it. But at this point, it's become a social media, um, a social media platform. And just like you're putting out football content, it's getting a ton of engagement. And at yeah. first I was like, ah, I don't know if I want to just start throwing football content in, in, into the feeds of like my, my old bosses and my old coworkers and stuff like that. Yeah. But, like if you're, you know, if you're a new content creator and you're trying to figure out a new way to uh, build an audience, man, LinkedIn is there for the taking because the organic reach is absolutely crazy. So that's something I'm going to hit on in the off season when I start doing those interviews. Yeah, it's, dude, it's been so tough on, on even like Instagram, like the, like the engagement rate, just the reach that you Bro. can get there, like organically is so different than it was even like six months ago that it's, it's Instagram, tough, man. Like Instagram's tough. done, bro. Instagram, I really think it's done. I think the organic reach wise, because I, I thought last summer when i started building my uh the instagram was like the first summer i i did it for for big dogs yeah we went from nothing to like 1500 and i was like i'm mm -hmm. i'm proud of that coming from nothing i was like this summer we're going to we grow we we grew on youtube from like you know 12,000 up to 35,000 so i'm like we're yeah. gonna see monster growth on instagram and it like went from 1500 to like 3000 i'm like yo this if this is what it's going to be from summer to summer next summer i'm going to gain like you know a thousand followers i need to yeah. start looking at other platforms so I think what I'm going to start doing is putting my Instagram videos on TikTok instead and just doing Oh, dude, you're, you're, I think most people, you're, we're killing your watch time right now for this video, but uh, TikTok is They love be this shit, don't worry. Oh, good, they're dude. Like so I'm completely with you. So Instagram, I put a lot of resources, a lot of time into Instagram. I'm up to like 7K. Um, but honestly, I put so much work into it. I haven't probably seen the ROI that I should have. I'm probably going to get to 10K for swipe ups and then really scale it back and really focus on things like LinkedIn, TikTok. I think TikTok's just a really cool platform because like, you, like you're getting all this engagement that you don't deserve. Um, and all like, right, there's not, right. there's not, there's so many people on the site that aren't even creators yet. Um, that like, it's insane. Uh, so I'm going to get in on that, uh, very soon. Uh, when I find some time, LinkedIn's awesome because, um, like you said, there's some people on it that don't really want to post content because of their old bosses or whatever it is like, but you got to understand like our niche too, outside of just fantasy football, it's business people that like to bet on sports, like to at least speculate on sports. So like I've seen a ton of engagement over there, uh, just because I think it's a kind of different market as well. And like I said, there's not enough content creators over there. So like the fantasy football niche, like if you're just coming up, like ignore the platforms that aren't going to re reward you for putting in work as a couple of those you want to be first on something that that's what I would say. Like if we could go back and, and if I could go back, I would have been on YouTube six years ago doing this exact same thing. And I have a hundred thousand subscribers. It's just impossible to do that now, unless you're doing uh, the complete uh, crazy grind that you do during the summer. So um, it's crazy, man. I love, I love the content stuff. We'll have to do like a follow up to that, that interview we did. Cause I have a lot of thoughts and a lot of things, a lot has changed. 
hundred percent. I can't wait to get back into those interviews. Uh, the cool thing about LinkedIn too, is like when you post something, the people that you engage with that comment on your stuff, like you get to see who they are and like where yeah. they work. And you're like, Oh my God, like this dude from Google just like commented on it. You know, it's the same people that are probably commenting on your YouTube shit or your Instagram yeah. stuff, but now it feels like more professional and the connections you make on there, like are in all different industries and you could really like pivot off that and do some, some crazy, crazy shit. You, you can't really troll anyone on LinkedIn because like, this is you, like this is, that's who you yeah. are. So like, it's funny cause I've seen some familiar names come over from other platforms, but like none of my trolls followed me to LinkedIn, literally. Yeah. So um, I started a group on LinkedIn just for start, start, sit stuff. So I know you wow. get that just flooding through your videos. So what I'm going to try and do, I mean, it's a free group. I'm going to go in there on Sunday morning for like 45 minutes and just answer, start, sit, no analysis, nothing. And then I'm just not going to answer anything on Twitter, not going to answer anything on YouTube for those anymore. So there's one spot that I'm going to go every week. That's, uh, that's really, really good. Yeah. yeah. So go, go make sure you're, uh, you're connected with Joe on LinkedIn if you want his free sit start help, obviously. At this point, uh, the amount of sit start questions I get, I only, answer, so I only answer those on Patreon. Yeah. Like if, yep. during the season, I try to answer as much as I can during the summer to help people out with the drafts, but uh, Patreon's the go-to for sit starts. And yeah, that, that's a, that's a very good idea. Did you already start that group? You did? Yeah, I started the group. Uh, if you just go to my LinkedIn page, you'll see it there. I've been running a, a contest as well. Uh, it's only on LinkedIn um, for the, I gave away a hundred dollar uh, entry to the spy on DraftKings last week. Basically you just kind of have to go in, connect with me, uh, throw a couple of comments, likes, just try and get the engagement up. Uh, got to give some incentive there. But I think a lot of those people that join my contest, they're like, just enjoying the platform because it's almost like Facebook was like five years ago. So um, get, get, over, get over, get over the LinkedIn is only business stuff. Like we're going to have some content over there. It's going to be great. Hell yeah. We're going to crush it. Let's do it. All right. Well uh, again, y'all, if you enjoyed thumbs up, subscribe to both of our channels, everything else will be linked in the description down below. Good luck in week nine. And we will see y'all next Saturday as always. Peace.